Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, and uh, I am joined again by Pastor James Hopkins of First Lutheran Church out in Boston. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, very well. Thanks so much for having me back. It's great to have you. Um, I, I really wanted to sort of take the chance to continue a conversation we we're having. We got to hang out uh, a while back at Symposia out in Fort Wayne, and we were uh, obviously doing nerdy pastor stuff because this is what we do. Um, but we, we started talking about Lex Arende, Lex Credende, because why wouldn't we? Um, and if you're at home, uh, what this means is uh, the way you believe has to do with the way you worship and the way you worship has to do with the way you believe it's it's sort of like well if you believe that the stove is hot you're probably not going to put your hand on there your beliefs are going to inform your behavior and and vice versa but at the same time um it, it's it's also uh it, it's it's something that's worth discussing because in a lot of ways uh we have we have sometimes set ourselves up to uh to try and solve problems that aren't there or in trying to solve problems without the actual right tools. You had uh, some really, really interesting thoughts on, on this, this idea um, that the way we believe has to do with the way we worship and, and vice versa. Pastor Hopkins, what do you got for me? Yeah, thanks so much. It's a, it's a wonderful topic, certainly one worthy of our nerdy pastor, pastor time and discussions. And I really, I think the first thing I want that I think about this years into the ministry by way of experience is that uh, we can take the wrong application of Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, and we can turn it into a reason to not be concerned with really the content, uh, particularly of our preaching. But before I get to that, uh, I want to caution us against turning Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi into uh, treating the liturgy of the church kind of like a safety net where as long as this remains in place, then we're going to be able to remain orthodox and nothing can harm us. Uh, and the liturgy becomes in this way, some sort of like a force field that's going to uh, keep a church on the narrow path. And while there are some good ideas there, uh, it actually hasn't proved to be true, right? We can actually see in our own time, plenty of churches with really uh, robust liturgies with all sort all of the external uh, things that we would attach to that to ornamental beautiful liturgy that have uh, you know more or less apostatized themselves and uh, we saw this uh, some recent movement towards this uh, in the Church of England last week and hardly anybody has uh, the pageantry that they do so what's our corrective for this how can we pre prevent ourselves from the liturgy? Uh, becoming a false god. And what I mean by that is not that anybody would worship it. None of us are so crass or anything like that. But uh, as Luther says, that faith makes both God and an idol. So how can we keep us from uh, putting our faith, right, in a place where God has not uh, commanded us to? And I think that is to remember that the, that the content of our preaching really matters, namely the content of our preaching being Jesus Christ crucified and risen, and that that's going to come down in well-divided law and gospel for us. And that uh, we also keep in mind really the third commandment, Luther's explanation in the small catechism, right? That we should not despise preaching and his word, but gladly hear and learn it. And what I mean in this discussion is that preaching belongs to worship. That's why it's there in the explanation to the third commandment. So it's not only the hymns we sing. It's not whether or not we have processionals and recessionals. All those things are wonderful, right? And those things actually can and do deliver the gospel to you. Uh, but the the preaching and the, the by your pastor and, you know, your responsibility as hearers to read Mark, right? Inwardly digest, right? You know, read this sermon if it's printed for you hear a sermon uh think about it talk about it with your neighbors talk about it with people at church talk about it uh, around your dinner table uh because as long as your pastor is preaching rightly and one of the wonderful joys that you have about being a member in the lutheran church of missouri synod is that you have an orthodox pastor who's going to preach purely uh god's good word to you and you're going to discuss that. Let that be on your minds and your hearts and your mouths. And then Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi proves true in the way that is best for you and for the church. 
Right. And I think it's a couple of things to kind of point out here. First, that um, first, I, I like the liturgy because I think it actually is the best way to, to deliver God's gifts and point to the fact that something really impressive is happening here. But also, so do Buddhists. Um, you, you can actually walk into a Buddhist temple and recognize because of, of uh well, the, the, the smells and, and because of the, the symbolism and because of the ritual that they intend for this to be a sacred thing. It, it, it's supposed to be an otherworldly experience. It's actually pretty easy to create that. But of course, there is no hope there because there is no Jesus there. What we have is in the gift of the liturgy, something that points to Christ and him crucified to, to deliver for us forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. If, if just sort of uh, chanting is going to, to somehow convey the forgiveness of sins, well, what are you talking about? And, and I love the way you sort of take this that and to, to what preaching is about. Preaching is about, well, it's, it's, it's from God's word. It is God's word made to be for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, so that it's not an either or. Either have a liturgy yeah. or have good sermons or just have good sermons and no liturgy, but rather you got to start to experience all of it here in the church service, that uh, this is not sort of a, an escape from something that somebody's trying to get out of, but but rather a recognition that, that uh, just dressing up in certain clothes, just speaking in certain tones or chanting just just sort of only singing uh, to a, a pipe organ will somehow keep your church uh, faithful, but rather it is the Holy Spirit. So we, we need to be after the things that are pointing to the Holy Spirit and, and quite frankly, delivering the Holy Spirit. That's right. And I'm really glad that you mentioned it's not an either or, mm -hmm. uh, but we should recognize it's, it's easy to create things which are attractive. You mentioned a Buddhist temple uh, in downtown Boston. We have all sorts of things that are attractive, but that does not make them beautiful because mm -hmm. What makes something beautiful is that it is true. That's a so really have a liturgy that is yeah. attractive, but more have one, have one that is beautiful because it extols Jesus. So one of the, the most uh, precious things about the liturgy then is that there's there's a clear definition as to what it's about. I, I think this might actually be sort of a helpful thing as we, we go through it. If you can do this thing uh, in, in a mosque or in a, a synagogue or in a church and it it's pretty all the same, it's attractive all the same, you're still not at true. It's still not conveying hope. It's still not conveying, well, like you said, beauty. I, I really like that distinction. So when we are at, at church, what are the things that we should be looking for then, Pastor Hopkins? Yeah. Uh, I think the thing that we need to be uh, listening for at church is what is the word proclaimed to us? Does this uh, accord with God's word given to us in scripture? Uh, what are we saying about ourselves? What are we saying about Jesus? And as long as those things agree, right, and, mm -hmm. and expound faithfully upon the word of God, uh, and that really alone, then we know that uh, we're in the right direction. And there's lots of ways that that happens, right? Um, you know, hymns use beautiful illustrations. So I personally am not bothered when a sermon does that either. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, G Jesus certainly uh, saw no problem with it. And uh, so a pastor who's also not preaching uh, for posterity uh, so that all nations after him will be able to hear this sermon, nations, generations. Um, but as a your pastor gets to know you better, uh, I think that more and more your pastor should be preaching also really for you. Uh, this is one of the challenges that happens. I mean, the liturgy can be the same everywhere and it's the easiest thing, but we pastors, namely, we're not, uh, little pieces that just are made to fit in a particular place. God calls us to serve congregations, right? Uh, so we're not merely functionaries, uh, with a particular character so that we can go and do a service. No, we are ministers of the word and sacraments to particular groups of people. Uh, namely congregations. And so you should be hearing the word of God really applied to you by your pastor who knows you. Absolutely. And that's actually what makes the sermons that, that have stuck around. The reason we can go back and read Luther's sermons from 500 years ago isn't because they were written intentionally to be read 500 years ago, but because they cared for the souls of that day. And I have the same sins. I have the same fears. I have the same struggles. And so I must have the same the same Jesus. But what, what turns the, the good sermon to the, the best sermon I've ever heard was, you're exactly right. It, it was because my pastor knew me and knew exactly what I needed to hear because he cares for my soul.
I, I really like that. So then when we go into to church, uh, we get to have both. It's, it's again, not an either or. We get to have the beauty of, of something utterly surreal, something otherworldly as, as heaven is crashed into earth, as God is manifest for us for the forgiveness of sins. And we even get to sort of point to it with, with some of the rituals that we have uh, because otherwise we would miss it in the same way that most people didn't recognize Jesus was God as he was walking around and actually doing miracles. Uh, but in the same way though, God wants to talk to you through your pastor. He wants to speak to you, to forgive you your sins, to, to teach you about truth, and to give you something beautiful to hold on to in this day and age and until life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Well, good enough then, Pastor. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great day.